It's wonderful to see so many people here tonight for such an important occasion, so welcome to everyone. For those of you that I haven't met, um, I'm honoured and privileged to be the Dean of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, Jim Waterston, and uh, your host for this evening. So again, thank you for being here. Um, this is our first Dean's Lecture for 2019, and for those of you that were at our last in 2018, you'll know that we shifted to a bigger venue to be able to fit uh, the many people that have been um, able to come to these events. And by the look of tonight, we're going to have to find a bigger venue still. So uh, we certainly welcome you all. And uh, I know our speaker tonight has uh, drawn great interest and, uh, and we're looking forward to that. But before we get on to um, meeting Megan, I'd like to start by welcoming um, Mr. Ron Jones from the Wurundjeri, uh, from the Wurundjeri uh, tribe and ask him to give us a welcome to country. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that um, beautiful uh, clapping to, uh, not used to that very much. Um, so I thought what I'll do, I'll clap you back. I brought the clap sticks to clap everyone on the country. So, <laughs> so do I want to clap back in uh, well, wondering clap sticks. Um, look, I'd like to uh, acknowledge any past and present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that may be with us here tonight and pay my respects to them and emerging elders that may be in the room with us, but all elders that are in the room with us. Of course, we respect all elders here in Wurundjeri, and we have a, a photo here. Now, um, this is a beautiful photo of three lovely Aboriginal women, very strong Aboriginal women. So the one here to my left is uh, my great-grandmother, Granny Jemima, that was married to uh, Robert Wanden, who was William Barrick's nephew. So to come from that bloodline is a fantastic thing, to come from William Barrick's bloodline. So the other beautiful uh, Aboriginal lady there is my grandmother, Nan Nevin. So she was what you de determined back in them days, a three-quarter caste Aboriginal. Now, the other beautiful little um, blonde lady there is my mum. So um, by Robarts, I think he was a mission manager at the time, and when mum was born, actually, they tried to hide it because they didn't want to see a white person out there, you know. And um, the stories that my mother told me about Corin Duke was something... Um, Terrific to her because she thought it was such a beautiful place, but it weren't. So when you have a look at immigration camps and everything today, so there's no difference. But our people didn't have no rights whatsoever. So um, they christened, um, of course, they put that word of king on William Barrick. So they decided to christen my mother Princess Bullum Bullum, which means white butterfly. So my mum and um, actually when that photo was taken, that Corin Duke had shut up and been shut up in about 1924 or something. So that photo was taken a little bit earlier. So they'd started to remove our people off of Corin Dirk, so um, my family was one of the last, last families to be removed off to uh, Cumbra Gunja, of course. Uh, a lot of my grandmother's brothers, which I thought were full bloods, were sent down to Lake Tyre, so we have a big wandering group down at Lake Tyres. So we're very proud about our history. And when I think of um, William Barrick, he was about 13, 14 year old when he was at the um, so-called signing of the treaty and witnessed uh, the treaty with Batman. But we within Wurundjeri, the people, the elders from uh, within the Wurundjeri and other tribes like um, Jarjarung, Tunnarong and all that, they probably wouldn't even know what they were signing because a lot of them couldn't read or write English. So their land was put up there, stolen from them and then, um, you know, when that letter went to um, New South Wales and they said, uh, Tully and Naris, you know, I mean, um, no people ever lived here, you know. So hopefully with that, um, the Uluru statement and that, and I'd love to see, firstly, that our people are treated and recognised as the first citizens of this country. And then we move on and move on from there, you know, and um, we were within we're wondering, a lot of things that are going on here, we're going through a process now of traditional owner settlement over Melbourne. And we have this um, First Nations that come from Native Title Reserves and the crap that they put up and the stummy they put up now, we've engaged anthropologists now, the government don't like it because we're ripping their stuff apart. So, especially with us within the Wurundjeri, we were always known as Yarra Yarra people, right up until 1984. The Wurundjeri were Yarra people. So they, you know, and I like, don't like seeing our history, because right through our history we were treated as Yarra Yarra people. And that's who my mum was and everything passed like that. And you know, when I look at my mother and my grandmother, they were in that walk off at, uh, well especially my grandmother was, when they had to walk off from Kamragunja. So you know, our family history has had a long involvement with um, when we, William Cooper and uh, owners and um, Doug Nichols and all them people were, walked off from Cumbra Guns and then um, in around about uh, 72 my mum was a part of setting up the first Aboriginal medical centre here that flowed onto the rest of Australia so you know we have a very long history and um, 
we could have walked away and said we weren't. We did have one person within were wondering was my grandmother's brother, of course you're so fair, Uncle Joseph. He was picked out to be a school teacher from Corin Dirk. He went off to become a school teacher and the last school that he taught at was actually Rosely in 1932. But it's so sad, him and his family would not recognise their Aboriginal people. And that's such a sad thing to think. And the history, and we'd like to see that documented. We did have Aboriginal school teachers back in them days, but the only trouble, they weren't allowed to teach in schools because they weren't citizens of this country. So, you know, a lot of people, and so a lot of our men that went away to war and all that, a lot of them weren't treated. When they came back and went on to mission stations and everything like that, they didn't get no pension, no nothing, because they weren't citizens and they couldn't get it. So one of my jobs within the Wurundjeri Council, I'm a cultural heritage officer as well, and um, I go out looking on a lot of sites, and sadly, a lot of our sites are being destroyed here. And um, it's so sad to see, because when they issue a CHMP, that's a cultural management plan, that's a permit to go in to destroy our history and our culture. And um, actually, I was working out a job two years ago, working out at Keela, where they were um, working on a Keela man out there. It's a skull there, and he's one of our oldest burials within um, Victoria here. And the skull is being carbon dated at about um, 18,000 years old. And we're out there doing a bit of work, and this young chap comes down, he pulls up next to me in this ute, and he hops out the ute, and he takes his sunglasses off, and he comes up to me, and I thought, oh, I must be something wrong with him, the way he's looking at me, like everyone's looking at me now. And he said, what are you doing here, you know? I said, I'm the Aboriginal Monta. And he took a step back and he said, Aboriginal? And I said, yes, I'm a very proud, wondering person. Then he walked forward again. He said, but you don't look Aboriginal. I said, I don't, do I? And he said, no. And he said, no reason why. I said, I'm like my mother. We're both born in the daytime. And my grandmother and great-grandmother, they're born in the nighttime. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people don't realise what goes on today. And the racism is still here. And, um, you know, it's so bad. Um, and I feel for a lot of our younger generation that's got to go in through the so-called Koori court system, you must plead guilty to go into that system. A lot of people don't realise, you know. So um, they say they're doing a lot of good things for our young people, but I don't think they are because they stamp it with that stamp and then they've got a conviction for the rest of their life, you know. And a lot of people don't realise what is still happening in their communities. They talk about the gap. The gap's not getting narrower, it's getting wider, bigger. And, um, you know, we, especially us within the Wurundjeri, I love it because the politicians, and I go and do a welcome to the country, I give it to the politicians. They can't do nothing to me because we don't get any funding. So, you know, all their money's... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the beauty of it, you know. So, um, especially in Victoria, we've got a long way to go, especially um, this, um, like I said, with um, raps, what you call raps, registered Aboriginal parties. It's creating divide here, and um, the government started that back in about 1999 when they set up the Cooler Nation again, so that's created a lot of trouble. And I'd love to see our people right through Australia unite and then get recognised as the first people of this country. So, look, I'd love to keep talking all night, but I don't want to bore you, so you've got other stuff to think. So thanks for having me do a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for your very warm welcome to country. And if people were looking at you, they were looking at you with great admiration. So thank you very much. Before I do introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to just share a few words about Theodore Fink, in whose honour tonight's lecture is named. Theodore Fink, uh, Fink was a prominent Melbourne figure during the late 19th and 20th century. In 1899, he was appointed chairman of the Royal Commission on Technical Education, which initiated basic reforms to the provision and length of secondary education. Uh, from my quick reading this afternoon, he was a uh, solicitor, newspaper proprietor, uh, educator, and uh, then blotted all that by being, becoming a politician. Um, that was meant to be a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> while Fink was committed to achieving greater recognition of the value of uh, secondary technical education, his education interests were vast and wide. In honour of his significant contribution to education and his association with the University of Melbourne, Theodore Fink's son and daughter made an endowment, endowment to the university after his death in 1942. This supports an annual lecture which is concerned with the historical or comparative study of Australian education with the purpose of advancing education in Australia. Our presenter this evening certainly meets the Theodore Fink Lecture's mission. I'm delighted that we are starting the 2019 Dean's Lecture Series with a topic of such importance to the future of Australia and to have Professor Megan Davis, the chair of the 2017 conventional, uh, Constitutional Convention, to deliver this lecture. Professor Davis has achieved many firsts in her career. She was the first 
uh, Aboriginal to be elected to your United Nations body and served as Australia's representative on the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples. For 10 years, Professor Davis, who was an expert in constitutional law, was a director of the Indigenous Law Centre at the University of New South Wales, and in 2017 was named the University of New South Wales' first pro-Chancellor uh, Indigenous. Last year, Professor Davis was honoured in the Australian Financial Review Qantas 100 Women of Influence Awards. In 2015, Professor Davis was appointed to the Ref uh, Referendum <coughs> Council which was established to advise on steps towards a referendum on Indigenous recognition. It's my great pleasure to welcome Megan to deliver this year's Theodore Fink Memorial Lecture and the first Dean's Lecture for 2019. Welcome, Megan. <laughs> um, and just like to thank Jim um, and the committee and of course Liz for inviting me to deliver this lecture tonight. Um, I'm honoured to be here um, and I just wanted to quickly single out just a couple of people um, um, who I've, I've worked with over the years. I just want to acknowledge Sana Nakara who is, I don't know where the hell she is, but she's an extraordinary young scholar here at the University of Melbourne. Um, incredible um, intellect and she's a We've got a very exciting career ahead of her and I love to watch her scholarship that's emerging and all of her um, the work that she's doing. So I just wanted to give her a shout out. Also, Professor Marcia Langton, of course, who I've worked with closely over the years on a number of things. We have um, grants together on um, violence against Aboriginal women, um, but mostly we've worked together on constitutional reform. We served on the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution, in, um, which started in 2011, um, when, when we first started collaborating and still now collaborating on constitutional reform. And, um, and, and I'd like to acknowledge Sean, of course, my fellow <laughs> Provost Chancellor um, here at University of Melbourne. And finally, Professor Hilary Charlesworth, who um, was my um, PhD supervisor. Um, when I was at uh, the Australian National University um, and a lot of my thinking around constitutional uh, reform um, came from that work um, I did, supervised by her um, with respect to constitutional reform and Aboriginal rights. So that was my very lengthy introduction. Um, so I was one of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who participated in uh, the Uluru National Constitutional Convention, but I wasn't there as a delegate or participant. I was a member of the Referendum Council who organised the dialogues and the Uluru National Convention. Um, but I have been a, a constitutional lawyer since about 2002 and worked on this issue of reform and recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution since then. And I'm also switching on my timer because of my tendency to talk for too long. Um, and so um, I was a part of the small group of um, subcommittee of the Referendum Council who designed the dialogues and that's what I was going to talk about tonight and talk about what came out of Uluru and then at the end make some comments about the significance of that for um, educators and the significance of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and these reforms for education more broadly in, in, in Australia. So in the um, time I have to speak to you tonight, I wanted to do the following. I want to give you some background to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I want to talk about the dialogues, you know, why were they needed, how were they conducted. Um, just very briefly about the reforms, voice, treaty and truth and then just some comments on where to from here. And if I do have enough time, I want to read out um, the, the Uluru Statement, not the Uluru Statement, but the part that everybody forgets, which is called Our Story. So the Uluru Statement is roughly 18 pages long, and the statement includes um, the story, the Aboriginal story of Australian history that we compiled over the course of the dialogues. So the beginning of each dialogue, people spoke about history, about truth-telling, and we've, we compiled that um, and um, put together the Aboriginal history of Australia, and that's called our story. 
all dutifully footnoted with the relevant dialogues around the country. Um, so to begin, um, my fake lectern's already broken. <laughs> so to begin, I just wanted to give you a brief background to what this recognition project is. I mean, really, it's something that um, has been ongoing now for well over, well, almost a decade formally. Um, as of uh, last year, in November, we have had eight um, uh, formal government reports in eight years on constitutional recognition. So eight and eight years, it's a lot. Um, and that's if you take your starting point for recognition, the expert panel that was set up by Julia Gillard in 2011. Um, some people like to take the starting point of the recognition process as John Howard in 1999, when he sought to recognise numerous polities in the Australian community in a preamble um, that would accompany the re Republic question um, in the referendum uh, uh, that was held in 1999. Um, so some people say that was when the recognition project began. And certainly, um, if you look at the trajectory of political discourse from 1999 to now, it's probably true to say that the political elite think of or thought of recognition until Uluru as being something like um, a statement of recognition in the constitution with no legal effect. Um, one of the problems with recognition <coughs> over this time it was the choice of the word recognition, of course. Um, I've said time and time again over the past couple of years, that, and I don't have to tell a room of educators this, but recognition is a very complex legal and political concept. Um, it is the subject of voluminous literature all over the world, this concept of recognition. It's, it does not just mean what it says in the dictionary, which is some form of acknowledgement. One of the key problems with the recognition movement in Australia is simply that the notion or, or the public and popular understanding of recognition never really rose above the threshold of that dictionary meaning, which was acknowledgement. Um, and that, and I mean, that, that is a lesson in itself for us, um, I think, as, as educators, um, in, in that people or the failure of the state and, and the community to listen to what it is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are saying. Because if you followed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander media, for example, you, you would not have been surprised by Uluru. You would not have been surprised that a large majority of the population um, reject a symbolic form of, of recognition. Um, and so I'll return to that a bit later, this concept of listening but not hearing what it is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are saying. So recognition was always a difficult word, um, which made the job of recognise the entity that was set up by the federal government even more difficult to prosecute an argument for amending um, the constitution to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because the word is just too, it's just too indistinct. It's just too amorphous. It means everything and it means nothing. And because there was no model on the table, it was very difficult to get anybody, at least um, in terms of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, to really support and commit to this notion of recognise. What are you recognising? We prefer to use the word reform because then if you look at the history of Aboriginal advocacy, political advocacy over the years, recognition can be many things. And it, can, and it does mean the many things that we've advocated for over the years, from designated parliamentary seats, reserved seats, to treaties and agreement making, um, to autonomous regions. And we know that towards the tail end of the ATSIC era, there was a lot of work being done on what autonomous regions would look like um, in different parts of, of the country. So recognition can mean many things. It sits on a spectrum. At one end might be symbolic recognition or acknowledgement, but up, at the other end, it also means substantive, concrete form of recognition, and that can be anything from a voice to parliament to treaty. And I think that the importance of Uluru is that we've initiated that conversation, that in fact recognition means something substantive, and what Aboriginal people want is at the very strong end of the spectrum. That is to say they want some sort of reform that compels the state to act that compels the state to do something. 
um, as opposed to just some form of symbolic recognition that doesn't compel the state to do anything. So, um, in terms of the background to recognition, what's important is, is that, the language of recognition, a complex legal and political concept, um, but also leading up to the work of Uluru and the Referendum Council, there was no model on the table. So the work of the expert panel was very important. There were five very important reforms that they placed on the table. Um, one was the deletion of Section 25 in the Constitution, um, which is a provision that contemplates that the states might pass discriminatory franchise laws. Um, it is a dead letter in the, in the Constitution, but nevertheless, it was a part of that package of reforms. A, a second reform was to amend, um, sorry, to delete the race power, Section 5126. This is the power that was amended in the 1967 referendum um, to enable or to provide the Commonwealth Parliament with the competence to make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. One of the problems with 1967 was the drafting it left it open as to whether or not the federal parliament could make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that were both beneficial, but possibly, arguably, um, detrimental, so adversarial to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interests. So that ambiguity was left open by the High Court, and after the, High, the very famous Hindmarsh Island case, this amending or deletion and replacement of the race power became a key part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advocacy for constitutional reform. So the expert panel recommended deletion of Section 25, deletion of the race power, and the insertion of a new head of power. So a new head of power that would enable the Commonwealth, the Federal Parliament, to still pass laws with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it would also contain a statement of recognition. So the expert panel did listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that they didn't want a token statement of recognition in the constitution. Um, but some people felt there was some value still to that statement of recognition. So it was tucked into this new head of power. It became a preamble to the new head of power. Um, interestingly, from that period of 2011, um, Julia Gillard's expert panel was that many, many non-Indigenous Australians um, also said that a statement of recognition was too tokenistic. Um, you can find the um, discussions with many, many communities um, around the country, the quotes on this issue in the expert panel report, but most Australians agreed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that a statement was just too tokenistic, it was too symbolic, and if the reform wasn't going to do anything to help communities, why would we be spending all this money on a referendum to do it? The final two recommendations of the expert panel was an insertion of a racial non-discrimination clause in the Constitution, um, which was drafted and designed, um, now known as Section 116A, so it would sit after the um, religious uh, uh, discrimination provision. Um, and then the final recommendation was for the protection and recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages in the Constitution. So that happened in 2011, the report was handed down in 2012, and since then we've been on this journey about trying to understand what, what is it, what reform is it that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples will support in terms of this concept of constitutional uh, recognition. So a number of things happened then between that report and the, and the creation of the Referendum Council which was at the end of 2015. So about three, three or four years passed, we had the creation of what they called the Recognised Campaign, which is a campaign funded by the federal government and auspiced by Reconciliation Australia to promote constitutional education in the community and education about recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, um, but other things happened as well. There was, of course, a change of government and the government, um, the new incoming government, led by Prime Minister Tony Abbott, introduced a policy called the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. Um, and that Indigenous Advancement Strategy came to really influence the shift from 2011 
to 2017 in terms of the reforms that the community supported. And I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. So by about 2015, we sensed a very strong shift in the community that they were not going to support reforms that appeared to be minimalist, meaning they would have a very minimal, if any, influence or impact upon communities, um, or symbolic. The reverse was happening in the, among the politicians, both parties, was that they were coming to a consensus that you could go to a referendum um, and do some form of symbolic recognition in the Constitution and some minor tinkering with the Constitution, such as, I said, the deletion of Section 25 and, and something to do with the race power. They hadn't settled on that. So a number of us went and spoke, who'd, who'd been on the expert panel, went and spoke to Tony Abbott before he was no longer Prime Minister, um, lobbying him on this point. He was very interested in having a referendum to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in some sort of statement or preamble. Um, we said that we saw a very strong pushback from the community, that they would not accept that. It was kind of left at that, and then he was, of course, rolled by the next Prime Minister. So it's, it's hard to keep up, you know, with who was who in this kind of eight to ten year period. Um, um, in fact, last year when my mum was in hospital, the, one of the doctors, she was in the emergency, and, you know, they come around every hour and ask, you know, your mum questions and stuff, and they've stopped asking the Prime Minister's name because <laughs> everybody gets confused. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so we had a change of government, and um, fortunately, Prime Minister Turnbull listened to what we were saying, which is, you actually haven't gone out and asked Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people what, what they think is meaningful recognition. We said this is a recognition exercise, and in any recognition exercise in any country in the world, it, it involves two parties, the, the recognisor and the to be recognised, and you must have the to be recognised on board. There was a sentiment among some senior leaders of that party that you could get this reform up and that the silent majority of Aboriginal people supported symbolic recognition um, and that you didn't need the Aboriginal vote to get the reform across the line. Um, we were very, very strong about the fact that you must have, you must have some indication from the community about what reform they support, that it would be utterly repugnant and obnoxious to go to a referendum that, that, that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community didn't support. Um, I should say that prior to Turnbull taking office, we had an important meeting at Kirribilli House in Sydney where we conveyed this message to Turnbull and, sorry, Abbott and Shorten I only go back to refer to that because I think it's very important to keep in mind when we reflect on the post-Uluru pearl clutching from the political elite that the Uluru statement was overreach. In the middle of 2015, at that meeting of about 40 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders from around the country, um, the following statement was issued to the media and, um, and, and of course, the politicians. It said, any reform must involve substantive changes to the Australian Constitution and it must lay the foundation for fair, the fair treatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples into the future. It said that a minimalist approach that provides preambular recognition, removes Section 25 and moderates the race power does not go far enough and will not be acceptable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So I, I, I just refer to that because I think it's a really important point. This statement was made in mid-2015, and so when the Uluru Statement was handed down in May 2017, it's extraordinary that people can have been shocked that um, the dialogues didn't support that framework of reform because they'd been saying all along that they wouldn't. So we said um, we need to retrofit consultation now with the community. Um, this should have been done up front. Um, 
the bulk of the referendum council probably argued that the community had been over-consulted um, and that they were ready to go to a referendum. We, we won that argument um, and we sought then to set up a subcommittee of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members of the referendum council, which included myself, Nor Pearson, Patrick Dodson, Tanya Hosh, Mick Gooder, and there are other people that I'm like, Delassa Yorkston from um, the Torres Strait, and Stan Grant. Did I say Stan? And of course, the co chair, Arnie Pat Anderson. You're nodding, going, do not forget Pat. Do not forget Pat. Um, and we designed a dialogue process. So, what we didn't want to do is go out and consult, um, because we know by that point, communities were at cons consult fatigue. So, we did a lot of research on deliberative dialogue processes around the world as they relate to constitutional change. We looked at the centenary of federation process in which a lot of work was done in primary schools and high schools on civics, civics education and constitutional education. And that was hugely helpful in the design of the dialogues. We also looked at the way in which the Northern Territory statehood Aboriginal conventions worked as well. Um, we wanted it not to be top down. So we, did, we didn't want to go in and run it. So we engaged the Aboriginal um, IATSIS, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, uh, uh, Institute of, no, it's the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, I'm sorry. I spend a lot of time with IATSIS and I'm just tired. So we engaged IATSIS to run the dialogues for us what they did was then engage local communities in local areas to run those dialogues for us. So mostly land councils were engaged to run the dialogues. Um, and we, we did have some conditions though. So initially we had 32 to 35 regional dialogues listed because we followed the ATSIC model. The government very drastically reduced our budget, so we had to cut that to 12. Um, so we chose 12 regions, the best that we could, um, and engaged the bulk of the land councils to run those. We wanted to ensure that the decision making was led by the cultural authority around the country. So the invitation list had to be 60% of our, the invites were traditional owners. 20% um, would be local Aboriginal organisations because, of course, the medical services and the legal services, you know, they're so integral to... Um, our local communities. And then 20%, it was really up to the land council or whatever entity that was running the dialogue to, to, de to decide how people could apply for the other positions. So they would be people like, you know, grannies, grandmothers against removals, young people, old people. <laughs> um, you know, people who've been in the struggle for a long time, just interested people. A lot of people walked off the streets too and just sat and watched. I think in Cairns we had more people watching than we did in the dialogue. Um, but that could have been the cyclone too. But um, so, so we, you know, we had walk-ins and people would um, come and come and listen. Before we ran the dialogues, we we held three meetings across the country to seek the approval of kind of key stakeholder groups. So we had a meeting with traditional owners in Broome to run the process by them, the structure of the dialogue, and the reforms that were going out. Then we had a meeting on Thursday Island with peak bodies, our national uh, Indigenous peak bodies. We did the same. And then the third meeting was with significant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders, um, including people who had long been in the struggle, and that was held in Melbourne. And so we got all of their feedback, you know, good and bad, on what we were doing and got their approval to go out and run these dialogues, which was a sample of our mob across the country um, partly at this point just to say to the government, symbolism is not going to cut it. That's not what people support. So um, we then wrote to the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader. We said, this is what we're doing. We said to Turnbull and Shorten, we're taking out these reforms. So they wanted us to just take the expert panel reforms, but we asked permission to take two extra reforms, one being treaty or agreement making, by this point, the Victorian process was underway and we felt that we couldn't ignore the elephant in the room. We'd done that in the expert panel. As Marcia knows, everybody spoke about sovereignty and treaty 
and, and because of the criteria that had been set up by the expert panel, we could only do a chapter on that, on each of those, to capture what the community was saying, but we couldn't go out again and just ignore that agreement making isn't something that people aspire to. The second option was this notion of a voice to parliament. So for a long time, people have spoke about reserved seats or Sami parliaments or, um, uh, you know, representative bodies being formally recognised in the constitution. So that notion of a voice went out as well. And so Turnbull and Shorten signed off on those reforms and we took them out to the dialogues. So the dialogues were run um, from December 2016 right up until the Uluru meeting in May 2017. They were run in Hobart, um, hosted by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Corporation. They were run in Broome um, by the Kimberley Land Council. Uh, in Dubbo by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, in Darwin by the Northern Land Council, one was run in Perth by the Southwest Aboriginal Land and Sea Council, one was run in Sydney by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, so they ran the Sydney one and the Dubbo one. A dialogue was held here, hosted by the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners Corporation, a dialogue was run in uh, Cairns by the North Queensland Land Council. A dialogue was run in Ross River, and that was hosted by the Central Land Council. A dialogue was run in Adelaide by the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement. One was run in Brisbane by a number of organisations out of South East Queensland. And the last dialogue was run in On Thursday Island, hosted by the uh, Torres Shire Council. Um, the Torres Strait Regional Authority and a number of other Torres Strait Regional Organisations. So they were the 12 dialogues run around the country and we had a truncated version of the dialogue in Canberra and that was hosted by the United Ngunnawal Elders Council and then from there, um, after we collated all the material in the dialogues, we held the National Constitutional Convention um, at Uluru and that was from the 23rd to the 26th of May. So um, I'm just going to say a few things about th those dialogues and then move on to the reforms. Um, we say that this dialogue process is unprecedented in Australian history. There's never been such a process that has involved, um, conven convened for um, and hosted by First Nations people on constitutional reform. I mentioned from the outset that of course, because of the funding, we couldn't speak to all 600,000 people, um, but we engaged a sample of 1,200 people um, from 12 of those dialogues. Um, and as I said, 60% of the invite list was traditional owners. So most of those regions had done some consultation prior to that meeting um, through the Land Council on the, the constitutional reforms. Um, every dialogue was run the same way, in exactly the same way, because it had to be, to ensure that everybody received the same information. We based um, a lot of the structure of the two days on the constitutional centenary framework, our foundation framework. Um, and um, we had the same kind of principles at every single dialogue. It needed to be impartial, the relevant information had to be accessible. Um, there needed to be open and constructive dialogue and mutually agreed and owned outcomes. So in relation to the relevant information being accessible, that was of course difficult. Um, we originally, so Arnie Pat engaged a number of, Pat Anderson engaged a number of ANU linguists and translated um, the dialogue papers into about 12 to 13 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, and including um, uh, taping uh, uh, short vignettes and videos on the different reforms. Um, but of course, it's difficult. Um, it's still difficult. In Ross River, we had um, four different interpreters um, interpreting our, the dialogue, which meant um, the legal lecture we ran, which was normally about two hours, went for almost five hours. Um, having said that, Ross River probably did have the, the, the most, um, the deepest comprehension of the legal reforms by the end of that, that process. 
Um, so, so everything was run precisely the same way in terms of its structure. So in terms of the structure, we um, had to open up by having the conversation I've just had with you about recognition. So one of the first things that would happen is people objected to recognition full stop and objected to, to recognise. So we would have to talk about and explain, of course, the legal and political uh, complexity around this concept recognition and ask people to just simply think about it as reform. So I worked with Rachel Perkins and we developed a very important film, a short film, that explained that history of reform advocacy um, of our mob since 1840, so that we were able to frame the debate and take the heat off this word recognition and just talk about constitutional uh, reform. Um, we did have to build in a, quite a lengthy third day um, to be able to deal with the important ventilation that happened from each of the regions um, about the state of their communities and the state of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. So we built in that extra day so that Saturday and Sunday we could just fo focus on the constitution. But that first day was really important because that's where the history story comes from. So the two key things people spoke about, the first one was truth telling. So everybody wanted to talk about the true history of Australia and the stories in their regions um, from before um, the invasion um, to after uh, the invasion to the period of massacres or frontier wars or killings to the era of compulsory racial segregation, the reserves and missions that I think Ron referred to in his um, beautiful Welcome to Country, um, the assimilation period where we saw um, removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, um, right through to the self-determination era and after. So the, the, the transcripts of the dialogues are quite an extraordinary rec record of some amazing people from around the country who s spoke to this truth, um, including elders in a number of areas who were witness to massacres in, in their region. So we built um, that extra day in to be able to hear those stories and record those stories. The second thing we had to listen to was how um, people felt that the Aboriginal sector had been destroyed by the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. So we're only just finding out now, and I suppose we'll find out better if there's a change of government, just how destructive that policy was. That took all of the money in all of the portfolios that go to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and pulled it. So took it all out of the different portfolios and pulled it in a bucket. So it effectively defunded huge numbers of activities across communities countrywide um, that were never refunded. Um, some of them were really early post-Whitlam self-determination um, um, activities and businesses and programs that communities ran and we collated this information too. It had such a destructive impact upon communities. Um, so when a lot of, when I came back after Uluru and all the Law Council of Australia lawyers were um, really upset that a non-discrimination clause had fallen away, I always say you need to understand what people have gone through since the expert panel's report. And the IAS has obliterated the Aboriginal sector. Um, and I remember talking to one politician just after the IAS happened, and he said, look, they just took a razor. They didn't look at what worked and what didn't work. Um, they didn't think. And now we have two Australian National Audit Office reports that show what, what a, what a, what a you know, in, in the next couple of years we will have a corruption commission. Some of this activity rises to the level of corruption. Um, and it all happened without much scrutiny whatsoever from the mainstream press. Um, and our communities have really suffered because of this policy. And it's that policy, I think, that really transformed the discourse from, well, let's do a non-discrimination clause to this idea of a voice. Because when we went out, that first day was really difficult. People feel voiceless and they feel powerless. And then when they travel to the cities or down to Canberra to lobby, they're told not to talk about it because it's deficit discourse. Don't even start me on that. <laughs> if anyone raised deficit discourse in the dialogues, 
we would say this is law reform, this is hard-headed law reform. To do law reform, you've got to talk about what the problem is. That's not a deficit, you're just talking about the facts. Um, and so what we heard from what were really um, on the ground, I know people hate to use this word, but the dialogues decided to reclaim it, grassroots communities, um, the voice is what they wanted. They wanted something that will empower them. They didn't want reserve seats or designated parliamentary seats because they'd seen what had happened in New Zealand and other places where those seats tend to become captive to party ideology. It's just the nature of Liberal Democratic governance. Um, they don't know what the voice will look like, and we have, of course, argued to the government that that process has to happen after the referendum. You need to do a really forensic um, dialogue process with the communities to really understand how things are working now and what a voice would look like in those communities. But there is no surprise, if you know anything about the community, that this voice to parliament was ranked one, and it was ranked above agreement making and treaty making. So the key point about treaty making falling where it did is simply that a lot of communities said they weren't in a position to negotiate complex legal agreements. Most communities have no leverage. Most communities didn't get a very good deal out of native title. And one of the things they all said was that their communities were still fighting and families were still healing and some families are still not talking to each other after that native title process. One of the things they did ask for was better dispute resolution services in communities to allow people to speak again. That's just one of the many reasons, but I thought it was quite a sophisticated um, position that the dialogues took with respect to agreement making. That they're just not, not some are, some are ready, but there's not a lot of leverage when you're going in to negotiate with the Crown um, something like a, a treaty agreement. Um, and then, of course, the final reform was truth. Truth wasn't an option we took out, of course. Truth-telling commission was not an option that, was took, that we took out. Um, and that's for, for, well, it wasn't really on the table in terms of the reforms. But the communities also didn't ask for a national truth and reconciliation commission. So I know that post Uluru, some people have come over the top and called for a national commission. That's not what the dialogue said. They spoke about localised truth-telling. The kind of truth-telling that they've already done through statutory land rights processes and native title processes. The kind of truth-telling that they do now with local councils and local historical societies. Nations were very adamant that they want to, they want to be in control themselves of truth-telling in their nation, in their region, and they will feed that up to some national body, probably the Makarata Commission, when they're ready. I just wanted to say one thing about the truth-telling. And that is just to read one quote to you um, from Ross River. One of the really quiet contemplations in all of the regions was, do our fellow Australians want to know more about our experience in our country? And this um, was one example from Ross River. Participants expressed disgust about a statue of John McDowell Stewart being erected in Alice Springs following the 150th anniversary of his successful attempt to reach the top end. This expedition led to the opening up of the South Australian frontier, which led to massacres as the telegraph line was established and white settlers moved into the region. People feel sad whenever they see the statue. Its presence and the fact that Stuart is holding a gun is disrespectful to the Aboriginal community who are descendants of the families during the massacres throughout Central Australia. So, I won't read the entire Our Story, which is a part of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, um, but it is full of similar quotes about Australia's failure to come to grips, not just with the massacres, not just with the killings, or even the reserve and uh, mission era, but even the stories of coexistence. Um, there was a real palpable sadness that the nation is not interested 
in our history. And so at Uluru, we adopted those three reforms as, as, as the framework um, that we argue is the framework required to move forward. Voice, treaty and truth. That is what the dialogues regard as meaningful recognition. So where to from here? We all know that the dialogues ended and we, hand, we issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart in May 2017. We um, strategically issued that statement to the Australian people. We, we didn't want to go through the ritualism of having a Prime Minister come and accept a bark petition or a painting or a statement and then it return to Parliament House and end up behind Perspex on, on the wall. And it wasn't lost on us, the Q&A straight after Uluru was held at Parliament House in Canberra. And they had um, the um, bark petitions sitting there in, per in, in a Perspex box when we walked on stage. And I thought, wow, um, you completely missed the point. <laughs> um, but we issued the Uluru Statement to the Australian people because we knew in this era of Liberal Democratic governance, we, we need to work with our fellow Australians to get this reform up, because it's we, together, who can change the Constitution. And that is how we did it in 1967. And that by issuing it to the Australian people, if they read it, and if they read our story, that they would be moved by the logic of the reforms to support it and support it at the ballot box. So we know that after Uluru, uh, the, the, the um, reforms were rejected by Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> Happy to say that, that, um, that we, we had that revolving door of prime ministers occur, not that it matters because the next one doesn't support it either, but <laughs> Turnbull rejected it for a number of reasons. But he did set up a joint select parliamentary committee. That's really important. And in the terms of reference, he did allow us to, to leave the voice, um, the reforms from Uluru in that joint select committee terms of reference. That joint select committee handed down its report in November, December, November, where they endorsed not only the Uluru dialogue process, um, the process at, at the national convention, but they also endorsed the voice as being the primary reform that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples seek. So that was important. That was important to get it back on track. Then at the ALP convention in December, the ALP adopted a referendum on a voice to the parliament as part of the ALP's um, policy agenda for its first term. That's really significant. Then in January, there was a bit of jostling between the Republicans and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over um, a very long... We, we know they... I mean, Turnbull likes to say, with a frozen continent, it's a frame, famous quote about the fact that we have a very difficult constitution to change, and it hasn't been changed for 40 years. It's the last time there was a successful referendum. The last referendum was 20 years ago, so it's true to say that everything we think we know about referendums probably doesn't play anymore. We're, we live in a completely different world. Um, but the Republicans want a plebiscite first and then a referendum. So sort your model out first. Um, and then we started to hear some pushback that they would run a, a plebiscite on a republic first before the voice referendum. So we were able to get a commitment then from Bill Shorten that he will run the voice referendum first and give us clear air and that he will run that in the first term. Last week, we had, of course, BHP and Rio Tinto sign on to endorse a referendum in the first term on a voice to parliament. They also endorsed the, endorsed the Makarata Commission um, for treaty making and agreement making. Um, but it's true to say that the miners, the big miners, that support's really critical if we, we need support across the political spectrum. But we must keep in mind, you know, a huge number of organisations have signed on already. We know that the Australian Medical Association has signed on and have said that they will carry their literature and their material in their GP um, surgeries. The unions were the first to sign on. Of course, the 
MUA was the first to endorse um, the voice to parliament. ACOS, the Australian Council of Social um, Services, of course, came on board. ACFID came on board. ACOS has a very important petition where they've got over 10,000 Australian organisations who have signed up to endorse a referendum on a voice um, and many Australian individuals. Um, so we, and we have a number of really significant announcements to come from corporate Australia, but in terms of um, the social sector, unions, um, many, many professional associations, many Australians from across the spectrum have already signed on to support this referendum for a voice to parliament. And one of the biggest things that they say about their support for um, Uluru is, is the power of the Uluru Statement and the fact that we issued it to the Australian people and in it um, we con contains the logic behind that reform. And what we're asking Australians to do is to, is to, is to back it um, and not ask questions um, about it that might derail the process. And I don't mean don't ask questions. Um, I mean don't push back on what we are saying, that what we think is... Is, is the right road ahead. And, and I say that because um, a lot of our allies and friends did do that straight after Uluru, pushed back on the reforms. Um, but, but we are saying, after this process, that we think this is the pathway forward. Um, I know I ha I'm running out of time, um, but I just wanted to make a few comments um, and it'll be in the, in the, the actual written paper um, about the educational significance and implications of Uluru. Um, I just wanted to say four things, really. One, one thing in designing the reforms that we were finding that period from the expert panel up to referendum council was the way in which empathy gets in the way of law reform. And a book came out around the time that we were designing the dialogues by a New York University, I think, um, psychologist called Paul Bloom. It's called Against Empathy. Psychologists hate it. But, but, but it really spoke to us because a lot of the arguments in it really resonated with us. People empathise with us. They want to walk with us. Um, but they won't support hard-headed change, structural change, that will actually allow us to take control of our, of our lives. And so um, in the paper I talk a little bit about the, the problem of empathy um, standing in the way of people just supporting really hard-headed constitutional reform. Um, because this is, this is not, not wishy-washy stuff, of course. People say, why are you going to go down that path? You know, you'll destroy race relations. And we're like, really? That's the least of our worries at this point. <laughs> The other book that was really influential was a um, scholar in the US called Jill Stauffer, and she'd done a study of um, and interviewed a lot of Holocaust survivors from many different concentration camps. And she, her book is called Ethical Loneliness, and that really resonated with us as we went around to all of the dialogues and heard Mob talk about the impact that voicelessness and powerlessness has on them. If I take something like the community of Yaraba, right, they delivered programs in their community since, since after Whitlam. After the IAS came in, they were, they were, they were entirely stripped of, of, of funding. There is not a single IAS grant that goes to a Yaraba Aboriginal organisation to run their own affairs. And they have, like, Save the Children and other not-for-profits coming into Yaraba and delivering cultural training to children. And, and, and educational programs. I mean, people have been stripped of their autonomy and their capacity to decide what their futures look like. I can't even under... I can't... I really urge all of you to read those Australian National Audit reports and just see what has been happening in the Indigenous policy area. It is an absolute travesty. But so this ethical loneliness, this, this idea that humanity has left, let you down so many times you, and, and humans are meant to help each other that you just isolate yourself. You know, and it's an ethical act. You're isolating yourself because you, don't, you can't rely on anyone to help you anymore. And the number one things that our mob spoke about in the dialogues was youth suicide, 
youth dislocation from the mainstream society, child removals, youth detention, these are the things that occupied the minds of the dialogues. And, 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 and these people, the traditional owners, the elders, the, the medical services and the legal services, they, they are saying that this voice to parliament, enshrining our voice in the constitution, will make a difference because it's Australians saying, OK, we recognise that you should have a say in the laws and policies that are passed about your life. I mean, that is a powerful thing. And on Monday, we have the Reconciliation Australia barometer coming out, which will show that 95% of Australians agree that we should have a say in our own affairs. Like, there are moons aligning here. We think we want Prime Minister and Cabinet bureaucrats out of our communities, and we want to take control again. So this ethical loneliness is this experience of being abandoned by humanity, compounded by the experience of not being heard. Of not being heard. It's named that because uh, it's a form of social abandonment that can be imposed only by multiple ethical lapses on the part of the human beings residing in the surrounding world. So Stauffer argues that not only is it caused by, caused by oppression and dehumanisation and abandonment, but also by this, the failure of just-minded people to hear well. The failure of just-minded people to hear well from those who have suffered. What recovery or reconciliation might look like after massive violence or long-standing long injustice. The failure of just-minded people to hear well from those who have suffered what recovery or reconciliation after massive violence and long-standing injustice will require. That is what the Uluru Statement is doing. We are telling you, the dialogues are saying, we are saying this is what we need to recover and, and hear us. So the last thing I wanted to do in ending, Liz, because I know that I've spoken over, is just simply to read the statement. Because I think it's the most powerful um, way of conveying um, what happened in those remarkable dialogues um, at the foot of the rock at Mutajulu. Um, these remarkable people that, you know, we had to shift the dialogues because we're all professionals. We're like, we'll have it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, people have jobs. You know, most people were low-income people. We needed to have it on the weekend so that they could attend and didn't need to get permission by the employers. They're, they're an extraordinary group of people who participated in those dialogues and at Uluru. And, and, and one day the nation will recognise them for who, who they are and the amazing work that they did, you know, in those communities coming in and talking about the Constitution for, for two days. Like, the Constitution for two days. <laughs> we gathered here at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science, more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and, and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished. It coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty 
can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most carcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at an unprecedented rate. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention and in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. And we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you.